This evening's scripture reading will be taken from Acts 7, 5. Acts chapter 7, verse 5. And now God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. I'm obsessive sometimes, and after three lessons on an overview of the Bible, I'm a little obsessed with beginnings in the Bible of different sorts. This morning you saw what we did, and then this evening I'd like to study the beginning of the nation of Israel a little bit more in detail than we briefly mentioned it the last few weeks. The reason I started in Acts chapter 7 is that that is Stephen's sermon when he's called upon to preach. This is the sermon that will get him killed. He's speaking to Jews, and he's going to start with Abraham. If you look up in verse 1... Then the high priest said to him, Are these things so? He's being accused of all kinds of things, being accused of blasphemy and that sort of thing. Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. On your Bible maps, that Mesopotamia would be to the right and down a little bit from where Israel is. And then Haran would be up north of Israel and then he said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, what we might know as the Babylonian land, and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land, that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years, that's Egypt, and, in the, nation, and the nation to whom they will be in bondage I will judge, God said. God told Abraham that in Genesis 15. And after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision, that gets you up to Genesis 17. And so Abraham begot Isaac, that gets you up to Genesis 20 and 21, and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. Stephen wanted the people to whom he was preaching to know that he knew Jewish history because he was going to take that Jewish history all the way up to Christ where it belonged. Now if you'll turn back to Genesis chapter 11, we'll start seeing some things for ourselves. In Genesis chapter 11, we have the call of Abraham starting at about verse 27. The verse says, this is the genealogy of Terah. If I'm doing my calculations right, Terah was in the 19th generation from the beginning of the world. And then Abraham would have been the 20th generation. I don't know if any generations were missed and you had grandfather for father and that sort of thing. But it seems that uh, Terah was the 19th and then Abraham was the 20th generation. So Terah begot Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begot Lot. You remember his account in Genesis 13 and then in the account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land. So he lost, Terah lost his son Haran. That left Lot an orphan without a father. And then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. They'd gone from Mesopotamia up to Haran. They came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Then chapter 12 opens with the familiar phrase, Now the Lord had said to Abram, this is probably the call that was back in Mesopotamia, and again repeated then in Haran after they stayed there a while. Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Notice in these poetic verses two imperatives, two things that he must do. One encapsulates verse 1. Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. He did not know where he was going yet, but he was told to leave. 
I don't know where I'm taking you yet. Well, God said, I'm, God knew, but God says, I'm not telling you yet where I'm taking you. But leave, leave your family and leave your country and go. And then the second imperative comes in the very last line of verse 2. And you shall be a blessing. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I'm told by some of the commentators who are Hebrew scholars that that's in an imperative mood. And that means that God is saying to him, you be a blessing, Abraham. Now, God would make Abraham a blessing also. But God's saying to Abraham, you be a blessing. So two imperatives. You need to leave. You need to trust me and leave. And then you be a blessing to people. And then in this passage, more familiar to us probably, are the various promises that God makes to Abraham and then by extension his people and really by extension to all of us. First of all, God promises him that he will be a great nation. Verse 2, line 1, I will make you a great nation. That's repeated a couple times in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 18, when Abram is talking with God about the people of Sodom and how many righteous people are still there, whether or not God would destroy them. It all starts with God saying, I ought to go down and tell Abram that I'm going to do this to Sodom because, after all, I'm going to make him a great nation. Now, that's a very loose paraphrase. And then Abraham has Isaac, and Isaac has Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. And in Genesis 46, verse 3, God reminds Israel, I'm going to make from you a great nation. And that was just an extension of the promise made here to Abraham. I'll make you a great nation. He didn't have any children yet. He was old. He didn't have any kids yet, but God said, you're going to have a great group of people come from you. This is testing a faith. And then he says, I will make your name great. Well, Abraham would become known as the father of the faithful, according to Romans chapter 4, verse 16. The father of the faithful from people who were in the patriarchal age who were faithful to God, people in the Mosaic age who were faithful to God, People in the Christian age who are faithful to God. Remember that Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 says, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Abraham's name is known. Everybody still talks about Abraham. We had the Abraham Accords a few years ago. Everybody still talks about Abraham. God fulfilled, of course, that promise, fulfilled all his, fulfills all his promises. And then God has another promise to him, and that promise is protection. Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. In other words, you're going to have some protection till I fulfill these promises. So if Abraham would go out of there without any children, he would have to wait 25 years for this son of promise. He'd get scared a couple of times at least in the meanwhile, but he didn't need to be scared because God had promised him protection. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And then God promised him seed. That is, in your seed, all families in you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 3 closes. Now, Peter knows that promise. At the end of Peter's sermon in Solomon's porch in Acts chapter 3, he's telling the people who are Jews and who've rejected Christ and who are still rejecting Christ after the Pentecost sermon, he says, God has sent Jesus to you first. First of all, he says, you are sons of the prophets in verse 25. You are sons of the prophets. He's been quoting the prophets that were predicting Jesus. You're their sons. You're the sons of the prophets. And of the covenant that God made with Abraham, saying, In your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul points it out that God, knowing that he would save the Gentiles, not the, just the Jews, but the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. God preached the gospel to Abraham back here in Genesis chapter 12. How could that be when Christ hadn't come yet, when Christ hadn't died on the cross? This is the beginning of the promise. There was a promise in Genesis 3.15 about the seed of woman overcoming the seed of the serpent. But then as far as calling someone through whom all nations would be blessed, God calls Abraham, says through your seed all nations would, of the earth would be blessed. That's the beginning of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preached the gospel to him when he said that your seed would bless all nations. And then, not to be skipped over, God promised Abram land. If you'll read down with me, down through verse 7. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. 
And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now that seems kind of old to be waiting on a child. And they were living a little bit longer than we are now in those days. But this was not the pre-flood sort of living where they lived to 900 and 800 years on a regular basis. Still, this is fairly aged. And Sarah was 10 years younger than he was, we'll find out. Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. Did you catch that? They're apparently pretty rich, aren't they? Matter of fact, chapter 13, verse 2 will tell us, Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And besides that, he had acquired people in his household. Now this obviously did not mean his children. It must have meant his servants. We'll find out in chapter 14 he had at least 318 trained military servants in his household. So for him to get up and move wasn't just like throwing on a backpack or a sack tied to a stick over and running away from home. For him to move was a mighty effort. And for him to move might have involved a whole lot of other things. We'll get back to those. Abraham, to, Abraham, verse 5, took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. There was a land promise. Well, then what did Abram do in response to all of this? First thing we note that he did was that he obeyed. You know that from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abram, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. He went out, and he didn't know where he was going. He went out. And he just trusted God to lead him. He obeyed. And we might also note the faith of Sarah here. It's worth noting this passage in 1 Peter chapter 3. Starts out with wives being told to be submissive to their husbands. Even if their husbands are not obeying the word of God, the wives by being a good example could be maybe the key that turns them to obey God. If They, just, they might have win them over without a word if they'll just be submissive. And then Peter says to them, not to let their adornment be merely outward, the wearing of gold, fine apparel, putting on jewelry and clothing, but rather let it be the inner person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Then he says, For in like manner, in former times, the holy women of God adorned themselves. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, husbands, if you're looking for your wife to call you Lord, you probably came to the wrong century and probably came to the wrong place. And I'm not saying that they should. But here's a statement of Sarah's faith. Here's a statement of how much Sarah trusted her husband. Where are we moving, dear? I don't know. Why are we moving, dear? God told us. Okay, dear, I'll go with you. That's faith. That's obedience. Genesis 15 verse 6 will say that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Paul would take that to mean that Abram was not justified by the works of the law of Moses because that incident came before the law of Moses. James would take that to say that Abraham was justified by works. His faith was working together work with his works and by works faith was made perfect. And the point simply is that Abram had enough faith to do whatever God said when God said to do it. That's the kind of faith that we need today. We're not under the same laws. Nobody's told us to move. Nobody's told us to go to a different place. Nobody's told us all nations of the earth are going to be blessed through us. But what an example. And then we also might notice that Abraham does a couple things that we don't know if God, act, there's no record at least of God telling him to do this, but it seems like a real good and honest thing to do. At the end of verse 7, it says, There he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now the law of Moses hasn't come in yet, so animal sacrifices as codified in the law of Moses are not in uh, account yet. 
But we know that God had wanted animal sacrifices all the way back to the Garden of Eden because Cain brought an offering of fruit and vegetables. Abel brought an offering of meat. Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Cain's was not. And it was not just because Abel had a better heart, as some writers say. Hebrews 11.4 says that Abel did that by faith. And we know faith comes by hearing the word of God. So there must have been some instructions to Abel and Cain back then. We don't have a record here if Abraham offered anything on this. But he built an altar to the Lord. And then in verse 8, as he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. You'll see that in Abram's story all the way up through chapter 22. Wherever he goes, it seems, he builds an altar. Some scholars have said you could trace Abram's journeys by the smoke from his altars. Speaking figuratively, of course. He builds an altar. Why? Well, maybe one idea is this. When he gets to the land of Canaan, those people were idolatrous people. The children of Israel would follow in their footsteps and be idolatrous people. And they would scope out every high place and every green tree and place their idols in all those places, God would say in the book of Ezekiel. And they become worse than their, the people that were there before them, worse than the Canaanites. Well, maybe... Just maybe, Abram is saying, you have an altar over there to your God, and there's an altar over there to that God, and there's an altar over there to that God. But I don't worship those gods. And even though my God is unseen and God is spirit, I'm going to make it a point to let you know that my God is different. Now if that's the case, that would be quite the step for him. Please look, if you will. At the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, where Joshua is calling the people together to give them a speech and a little bit of history about where they came from before he leaves them. In Joshua chapter 24 verse 2, Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other people gods. Abraham had grown up in a household that was idolatrous. Abraham had grown up in a household that had other gods. And yet God called him. Maybe he's learned the lesson and become monotheistic by this time. Abraham has a lot to his credit in this passage. It's great. Romans chapter 4 speaks a lot of him. Romans chapter 4 verse 20 says, he did not waver in unbelief he did not waver in unbelief, but counted God to be faithful and gave him the glory for it. I forget the exact wording. But now, let's look at what happens next. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. Egypt seems to always be a going-to place for the children of Israel. They'll go down there under Joseph because of a famine again. And then they'll come out of, up there. And then when they get hungry in the wilderness, they'll wish they were back in Egypt. And then Jesus and Mary and Joseph go down to Egypt around the time of Jesus' birth that the prophecy might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I've called my son, Hosea chapter 11 verse 1. Egypt seems to be the going-to place. So there's a famine and Abram goes down to dwell in Egypt. And maybe it was because Egypt had the Nile River. And maybe they didn't have all the rains in particular that they needed all the time. But the rains from upstream would flood that Nile every season. And the flood would go out and deposit rich water in rich soil. And then that soil would be enough to bring forth good crops when a lot of the rest of the world might be starving. He went down to Egypt because there was food there. Verse 11. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Now some scholars stop there and they say, wait a minute, Sarah was 65 years old. How could she be beautiful? I'll let you deal with your wives on that one. She could be. Why not? There are 65-year-old women that are beautiful even today. And besides that, they weren't aging quite as fast back then. She was a beautiful countenance. Therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they'll let you live. Now some of the commentators that I read tell us that 
and I'm not schooled in Egyptian history, but I've read that the Egyptians did have a reputation for that sort of thing. Travelers came through their land, immigrants came through their land, and they saw a beautiful wife, and they killed the husband and took the wife. If there's no God, why not? If there's no morality, why would that be wrong? That's what happens in Genesis chapter 20, when Abram does the same thing, and he's asked why he did that. He says, because I figured there's no fear of God in this land. Well, he doesn't say all that here, but he's scared. And he's telling Sarah he's scared. And then he's going to ask Sarah for a big favor. Verse 13, please say that you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. Now we'll find out in Genesis chapter 20 that she was his sister, the daughter of his father, but not the daughter of his mother. She was his half-sister. You still can't defend this as the truth. It's still, uh, you know, half lie, half truth is a complete lie. And you're still wondering what Abram's thinking on many levels. A husband is supposed to protect his wife. A husband is supposed to honor his wife. And here's, he, he is saying, put yourself out there in danger. Let yourself be captured. Let yourself go wherever they'll take you just as long as they don't kill me. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. We don't know what all, I hope we don't think anything, there's no record of anything happening, but he was, she was taken to his house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, ma female donkeys and camels. But, we would think before any thing went awry. The Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? God, who had promised to protect Abram, stepped in and sent curses to those who were a threat to this plan that God had. Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Now there are a few things to deal with in there. First, scholars, skeptics, atheists like to mock the idea that Abraham married his half-sister. And they like to claim there's Bible contradiction. Because Leviticus chapter 18 verse 9 and verse 11 tell a person you shall not marry your sister, the daughter of your father or the daughter of your mother. So it's real plain that it's not even a half-sister you're supposed to marry. Also the same kind of language comes up in Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 22. There are all kinds of laws against any kind of incest in Leviticus 18 verses about 6 through 30. Why is he married to his sister? couple things to consider. One, even if he was, the Bible never says that Abram was perfect. It says that God was using him. But that still doesn't satisfy the way that it seems that God treated Abram at this time. And so you have to look a little bit beyond that. Same people will also mock the idea when they ask, where did Cain get his wife? If Adam and uh, Eve had Cain and Abel, where'd Cain get his wife? One fellow who was kind of steeped in atheism for a long time, just never had much use for the church. He wasn't an angry atheist, he just never had much use for the church, stumped me with that question one time until I showed him in Genesis chapter 5 that Abraham, or Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters also. Well, that answers the question. He would have had to marry one of his sisters. There's a good article on, on the internet by uh, Trevor Major and uh, I forget who else that I read this afternoon that gives a good insight. And this kind of thinking is all throughout apologetics. And that is that as the world deteriorated, after the flood especially, the genetic problem became a real problem. And before that, it wasn't so much of a problem. So that by the time God gets to Israel, he wants to protect them, gives them that law that the genetic problem ought to be 
uh, observed so that they don't marry in a family and have children with genetic problems. And that law sort of has been observed throughout Judeo-Christian tradition even though it's not explicitly spelled out in the New Covenant. It used to be you had to get a blood test to make sure you weren't too close a relative or some other things didn't, and you had to make sure you weren't too close a relative in order to be married. But back at this time, early in the history of the world, it wasn't quite a command yet. The way God decided to populate the world, it couldn't have been a command at the beginning of the world. And so we don't find really any fault with Abram in that regard. Then secondly, you have his lie to contend with. Why is he not rebuked for his lie? And thirdly, you have his selfishness to contend with. Why is he not rebuked for his apparent selfishness? Lump in with that his fear after God had said, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Well, the answer is simple on one level and maybe a little more difficult on another. On the simple level, once again, there was only one perfect human being in the history of the world, and that was Christ. The people that we call Bible heroes from the Old Testament may have been great, indeed, great Bible heroes, and Abraham would become the father of the faithful. <coughs> Excuse me. Abraham would get to the point that he would perform this great act of faith of being willing to offer his son that becomes the pinnacle of any kind of faith object lesson that you would ever want to give to anybody. But Abraham was a human being. And you'll see throughout Genesis 12, 13, 14, up through chapter 22, he sort of had his ups and downs. That gives me a little bit of comfort because sometimes I have my ups and downs. I don't want to excuse my downs. I don't want to say, oh God, just accept my downs. I'm going to do those every once in a while. I don't want to be flipping about that. But it does give us some sort of comfort to know that the God of grace and the God of mercy can call somebody like this out of an idolatrous household and form him over his life into someone who becomes known as the father of the faithful. Now God is not going to call me like that and I didn't come from an idolatrous household. But God calls all of us now through the gospel and he can take us from whatever we were and form us into the image of Christ, Romans chapter 8 verse 29, and make us new creatures, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And that's something for which to give thanks in the Bible rather than let it confuse us and question us. But then the second part of this problem is this phrase in Romans chapter 4 verse 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith giving glory to God. Here I just preached for about two minutes saying that he kind of had a down moment and he must, you could translate that he wavered at his, at his faith. But Paul says he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. What do, we, what do we have here? Who's right and who's wrong? I don't think I disagree with Paul. I think everybody has their ups and downs of faith. But at the end of your life you look at somebody with a broad scope. And at a funeral you say, this was a faithful man. At a funeral, you say, this was a good woman. This was an example of faithfulness. And you don't bring up all the things that they did before. In my opinion, the best answer that I have is that Paul is looking at the whole of Abraham's life. And though he made some mistakes, he always came back. And he finally worked to a person of faithfulness, the likes of which the world probably has not seen outside of just a few people, including Christ, of course since then. And so it's fair to say he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. What lesson do I get from such a detailed study? The lesson I get, first of all, was to remind me that God had a plan to bring Christ into this world. He could work that plan through any obstacle that ever came. If Abram goes with his wife of promise down to Egypt and says, here, take her, God's going to intervene and say, no, that's not exactly the way I had it planned. And he'll do so without without subverting anybody's free will. He's just amazing that way, in every way. And secondly, we can learn that when God says to do something, we ought to just do that. We may not understand why. Now, we do need to understand why we're baptized for the remission of our sins. We need to understand that. But we may not understand where God's going to lead us through life. We may not understand every particular about what he wants us to do. But we do it by faith we obey. And so with that, we offer the invitation tonight. If you know the 
plan of salvation of the New Testament, to believe in Christ and confess him, repent of your sins, and be baptized for the remission of your sins, just do it. Just obey that. And then be faithful to him. And if you have your ups and your downs, keep coming back. Try to avoid those downs. Try to be perfect. But when you have those downs, know that you serve a just and loving and merciful God. If we could help you tonight, would you come as we stand and sing?